Yes, I guess that's my cue. Welcome uh, to this cloud migration story, or at least when often when you hear about cloud migration story, it's, it's about moving into the cloud from somewhere else, from on-premise or something. This is just a much, as much about uh, modernizing a current platform. So the migration happened in Azure or within Azure, from Azure to Azure. Uh, a lot of it was uh, about modernizing our own cloud platform. Um, but if you've read the abstract for this talk, uh, you'll know that there's a fairy tale twist to it. Uh, and by it being a fairy tale, you already know that there's a happy ending. So, so that's good. Uh, and one of the reasons I could be here, <laughs> if it wasn't a happy ending, it would have probably looked a bit different. Um, but so, because there's a fairy tale twist, I also try to. This is the first time I'm doing this talk, so I have some other examples of uh, of the cover because this might be a little bit boring. So I thought maybe I could try something different. Um, so that's me. So if if you don't know the movie, it's called A Cinderella Story. Uh, so this is the the movie cover. Uh, framed. Um, so that's one part, that's a movie cover. Uh, I also have the Disney version, <coughs> which, um, <laughs> yeah. so I, I'm, this was supposed to look like me. I'm not sure if that's uh, accurate. I, I think it, it ended up looking more like a, a Disney drag queen, but uh, yeah, it, you can't win on Fiverr every time, but uh, so maybe, maybe I'll just stick with the original cover. I'm not sure. Um, but anyway, <laughs> my name is Morten. I work for a company called Umbrago. Uh, we make an open source content management system, uh, and we also make a cloud offering uh, where we host Umbrago in the cloud. I've been with Umbrago uh, since uh, 2011, so a bit more than 10 years now. Um, I'm an Azure MVP. I do a lot of community stuff in Copenhagen, both for the Azure user group and the .NET user group. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter uh, if you want to. But, uh, but let's dive into it. Uh, so, like with any fair tale, this uh, migration story uh, has a, a storyline. Uh, it starts with, uh, yeah, so me <laughs> or me uh, in this scenario. Uh, it's it starts with uh, the team, the development team, uh, which is a huge part of this. I'm not sure how happy they are about being depicted as mice, uh, but uh, they're just as happy as as these mice. So, so maybe it's okay. Um, then we have uh, our management, uh, a huge part of it. This is our CEO, Kim. Um, we have a bridge that we need to cross uh, as part of this migration story, uh, which, like in many cases, uh, has identity hiding under it, something we need to deal with. Uh, we have a physical file system that we need to deal with. I'll go more into the challenges and, and what it meant for us. Uh, and then uh, DNS. Uh, is for some reason always a problem. Uh, it was a huge challenge for us that we needed to tackle. Um, and like any other great uh, fairy tale storyline, there's a villain uh, at play as well. Uh, and then towards the end, hopefully, we'll end up with a, a pot of gold, um, which will make everyone happy, especially management. But first off, what is Umbrago Cloud? I don't know how many of you are familiar with uh, with Umbrago already. A few, not that many. Okay, um, so uh, let me explain a little bit about uh, what it is. Um, when you host Umbrago in the cloud, uh, from our perspective, uh, what we give our customers uh, is what we call a project. A project can consist of up to three environments, uh, development, staging, and live. Uh, it can also just be one environment if you, if you wanted that. Uh, we have three different tiers uh, that you can choose as a customer. Starter, Standard, and Pro. Um, depending on which you choose, you get all the environments as part of the box or just one of the environments. It also determines uh, how many uh, websites we run as, as part of the resources which are available. Um, so the, the bigger the tier you have, the fewer the resources you share uh, with other uh, customers. Then the website itself. So each of these environments is, uh, is an instance of Umbrago running, so an instance of a website. Uh, Apart from that, it has a Git repository, which we use for deployment purposes. Uh, it has a Kudu website, so if you're familiar with Azure uh, App Service, uh, it has this admin uh, type website, which gives you a, a view of the file system and it lets you do certain things like behind the scenes of the website. So we have that as well. And then we have a SQL Azure uh, database for each of these environments. So each environment has its own database. 
deployments through Git. This is all uh, hosted as part of our Embargo Cloud platform, which consists of the platform, which is the hosting itself. Um, so the resources uh, that's needed for running the websites, uh, it's the services that we run as part of this whole setup, uh, making it possible to, to provision uh, the websites and being able to deploy between environments. And for that, we have our cloud portal, our own portal that you go into as a customer user of Embargo Cloud uh, and interact with it, create new projects, uh, add host names and so forth. So a lot of management that's done uh, is done through the portal. Then we have our CMS, which is uh, more of a, a platform as a service offering where you can uh, basically do anything to the CMS, to the website deployment, uh, and push it to our cloud offering. Of course, it's already it's always uh, with Umbrago, um, but you have more or less full control over uh, what's deployed with the CMS. Then we have a headless CMS offering, which is called Umbrago Hardcore, um, which is more of a software as a service offering. So you, you don't have access to the file system, you get access to the back office. And then apart from that, you have APIs that you use to interact uh, to get content uh, out of the CMS. So, so that's the, the like the high, high level overview of, of what Umbrago Cloud is. A lot of infrastructure, services around it to support what we need to do. So if we look at the infrastructure topology of what we had, um, that would be up until three years ago, it was very much focused around uh, virtual machines um, and running our whole setup on, on virtual machines. And it included uh, some proprietary software from Microsoft which was a little bit of a black box for us because we couldn't change it. It was something we installed. Uh, but the good thing with this was that it, it allowed us to get up and running very quickly. Uh, so to Sam's point from yesterday about starting uh, uh, small and, and using something that's available to you, this allowed us to get started really quickly. It gave us something that resembled Azure websites quite a lot without it being it. Uh, the downside to that, of course, was that we had to maintain a whole lot of virtual machines ourselves. Uh, we had to maintain a central database that stored all of the information around the infrastructure and all of this. And because a lot of it was a black box, uh, there was very limited what we could actually do with it. So um, we had, as I said before, we had a lot of services which uh, we used to provision uh, a website, for example. Originally, this was all installed on those virtual machines. Um, so the, for our first approach to it was basically creating uh, Windows services using something that's called Top Shelf. It was uh, a, an easy way to get started and install some services that had access to everything because we own the virtual machines, we own the file system. We can do anything that we wanted to by installing a service uh, on a Windows server. But as we, as we grew and had more developers come on board the project uh, and start working with it, uh, deploying Windows services became kind of a pain. So we moved to Windows containers and then a container host uh, and had our services running on that. And then eventually we ended up with something like 32 services running on a Docker VM host, um, which is maybe not ideal, at least not for us. <laughs> it, it worked and it was fairly stable, I would say, but uh, it's not an ideal solution because we didn't have a way to, um, to have uh, multiple instances running of the same services. So uh, at some point we reached uh, like the end of what can we achieve with this? Uh, and we ended up with uh, quite a lot of challenges that we had to deal with. Um, so the first off the infrastructure, um, all of the people working in Umbraga at that point in time was developers. We didn't really have operations people. Uh, we needed to bring some on board, but we didn't have operations people. We didn't have database experts. So a lot of it fell back on us uh, and developers was kind of forced into being uh, infrastructure people. Um, we wanted to spend more of our time developing features uh, on top of Azure and, and do something that made value or gave value to our customers. Uh, but we ended up spending quite a lot of time on actually just running and maintaining this whole system. Um, and especially around the black box product, when you, when you create, when you use something that's an off the shelf product, uh, it's very often limited uh, what you can do and how you can extend it. Uh, and the points of extensibility was, it became more and more of a, a, a limitation for us 
as we wanted to grow our business and wanted to grow on Braco Cloud and the features that, that we expose to our customers. So um, it became more and more challenging. And stability also became an issue uh, because the way that this was set up, it, it wasn't really prepared for the type of scale that we were running or trying to run. But then in order to actually move to something else, when you're based around a, a setup like having virtual machines and having a file system where you own everything yourself, uh, when we start moving stuff, the physical file system starts becoming a little bit of an issue because if our customers upload something to their website, then it's certainly a unique thing. When you have full control, that's uh, maybe not that big of a problem, but when you need to move it around uh, and for it to become more fluent, then the file system becomes a problem. It becomes problematic that we have to move all of the files around. Uh, one of the first things we did was to move uh, the media that you upload into the CMS uh, to blob storage, so creating a blob storage provider uh, and moving all of the media into blob storage. So we have a central way that's scalable and that can be used uh, from anywhere. Then uh, we had uh, an issue with identity, since when we started out, we didn't really have a single sign-on solution. We had more of a always sign-on, because no matter what you did, you had to sign in, uh, which is also less than ideal. So when you had multiple projects uh, on Umbrago Cloud, you needed to sign in to every one of the back offices every time you wanted to use them. So there was no single sign-on. Uh, and the, the logins, the actual, the uh, authentication part was decentralized, so it was in each of the instances running. Um, so not ideal. And then DNS. And I'll just post this because it's DNS, so yeah, that that was a challenge. Um, because when we started, we I mean, we didn't really anticipate about what it would mean when we moved. So we created a public IP in Azure, uh, which all of our customers got. Like when you want to put your custom host name on your website, you just use our public IP, or you can use an internal host name that we provide, and then you can point it to that as a C name. Uh, but when it comes time to moving, that's quite challenging because if that host name is pointing directly to a resource um, that needs to change, then it means that the customer has to update their host name when that change happens. So for us, that means that we can't really move that instance around uh, to somewhere else because we have a dependency on the public IP that public IP, we can't just change around. It's tied to that infrastructure. So if we were to move to app service, for example, um, then it becomes problematic because you can't use that IP for, uh, for, um, for app service. Um, we also had some, some TLS uh, automatically being created behind the scenes. Um, so at this point in time, when we were getting ready to move, a lot of it was tied together to this public IP. Um, so that means that we had to come up with a solution where we could uh, actually have more control over how we move resources around within our system without affecting the customers and needing them to update their DNS. So as, as part of this uh, migration story or modernization story, we, we had uh, quite a few goals that uh, we wanted to achieve. Um, the main one was stability. Uh, we reached a point in time where uh, this database, which was a part of the system, uh, became a single point of failure. It was difficult to, to keep up and running. Uh, we had to do a lot of maintenance around it uh, to make sure that it was running. Uh, I think we reached like the, the depth of, of what you can achieve with that database uh, in terms of um, how many sites we were running within one system. Um, and then we ideally wanted to move to something where uh, we can get the benefits of platform as a service where we don't have to do the maintenance, we don't have to dedicate a full team maybe on, on doing operations, but we can actually focus on developing new features uh, and let someone else handle the platform. And uh, as part of moving, ideally we wanted to uh, come to as close as possible to zero downtime deployments. Um, because when we, when we move stuff around, uh, it can potentially mean downtime. If someone needs to update DNS, and switch stuff around if as soon as something manually is involved, uh, it, it can potentially mean downtime. So uh, that's one of the goals around moving, that uh, as part of moving, we want to be able to make sure that everything is running uh, while we're moving and they don't see the negative effect of, of being moved. We wanted more flexibility, uh, obviously. Uh, we reached the depth of what we could achieve 
with the system that we had. Uh, so we wanted to be able to provide more extensibility points for our development teams so that we could create new features um, and make it, make it easier for us to expand to other regions. If we were to do this uh, whole infrastructure as a service setup, uh, it's, it's a lot of manual steps in installing it. So it's not really feasible, it's not scalable in terms of expanding to other regions. So with this modernization part or the modernization part of, of moving, uh, we wanted to make it easier for ourselves to expand to other regions. As part of uh, moving, there's really two points to it. One is the, the hosting platform itself. Uh, so running the websites on infrastructure as a service and moving that ideally to a platform as a service. And then the other part of it was service infrastructure. So running our own services on something that's scalable, something that we can continue to, to work on and have teams grow and uh, add new teams uh, to, uh, to our company and have them create services and get up and running, creating new services as fast as possible. So um, I mentioned app service a few times and, uh, and that's actually what we eventually decided on moving towards. So for our hosting platform to be based on, on Azure app service uh, instead of what we had. Um, we had wanted that for a long time and we've been kind of eyeing it, but at that point in time uh, where we started out, it was too expensive for us to start uh, using. But then when we actually decided to go ahead with this, uh, luckily for us, um, Azure App Service came with uh, the option to reserve resources, uh, which made it a lot more feasible for us cost-wise um, to, uh, to run on App Service because we could reserve and get the benefits of uh, reserving an instance for one year or three years and then getting a significant discount on that. So because when you run virtual machines, you can also reserve those and they can be very, very cheap to run. Um, but with App Service, it actually became more and more feasible to run a whole setup uh, on there. And then of course, we would get the benefits of it being platform as a service. Uh, we wouldn't need to do the same type of maintenance uh, on the hosting part of it as we needed to do uh, with infrastructure as a service. So quite a lot of benefits that we would get out of this, uh, but there was also some challenges uh, because we don't have access, direct access to the file system. So we couldn't do some of the same things that we were used to doing uh, when we were hosting the file service ourselves. So we needed to come up with a solution for that as well. And then for the service infrastructure, um, we focused on a uh, boundary context. So if you're familiar with the DDD terms, uh, domain driven designs, uh, we looked at uh, what are the boundaries for the different services that we have? Uh, does it fit with our teams? Uh, can we have a team that focuses on one specific boundary context, for example, deployments or permissioning or hosting, um, and then use that to get team independence and team separation. And uh, speaking of teams, uh, I'll just show you a little bit about how we progressed uh, at Umbrago when we started with this. Uh, we started with Umbrago Cloud in, in 2015, uh, where we were two people working on it, uh, getting this whole setup installed. Uh, two developers, myself and, and one other guy, uh, who he had to learn PowerShell. I could just continue writing C Sharp, so I guess I, I won that. But uh, then we expanded, we became a cloud team. Uh, then we became a cloud team and a DevOps team. Uh, and yeah, I didn't pick the DevOps name, that was someone else, uh, but it was more of an operations team um, than, than anything else. Um, then we'd expand it to more teams, and today uh, we are just about to make the split around having a team that focuses on agency experience uh, for the web agencies that use Umbrago Cloud, uh, and another team that focuses on developer experience when you as a developer work with Umbrago Cloud. And then we have our platform team, uh, and the team that works with Headless uh, CMS uh, and an SRE team. And if you are um, in, in a position where you need to make decisions around how you uh, structure your teams, uh, I would just like to mention this book. Uh, I think it's really good. It's called the Team Topologies. Uh, it has a lot of uh, valuable information uh, around structuring teams, around uh, uh, being streamlined. So if you work with product development, um, there's just a lot of uh, golden nuggets in there um, that I can recommend. But so we talked about the challenges with our uh, previous infrastructure. Now we've decided to move to Azure App Service. 
Uh, let's look at what that looked like in the, in version one of the new topology. So I'm not sure how much you can see of this, but uh, it's it's divided up into uh, two different parts where we have uh, Azure App Service uh, with uh, some app service plans. Each app service plan can have up to X number of uh, web apps. Um, and then we differentiate between the different tiers that we have in our own cloud offering. So that when we create uh, starter plans in Umbrago Cloud, uh, it's a certain number of web apps that we put on one uh, app service plan. And then as we grow up in the tiers from to standard and then pro, it becomes fewer and fewer. So uh, the pro plans uh, have more resources available and fewer uh, noise, potential noisy neighbors. Um, all of that is provisioned uh, automatically on demand when it's needed. Um, and we position it so that um, when a, a new web app uh, needs to be created, it be cre it's created within an app service plan, which has space for one more web app. And then when something is deleted, we take it out and then we mark it as deleted. And then it means that there's room for another web app. So continuously filling it up, ensuring that we have a good uh, spread of uh, uh, of web apps across app service plans, because when we fill it up, when we fill up an app service plan, that's when our cost is the best. Then we have databases on the side that's also provisioned uh, automatically, one for each environment. Uh, we have our services uh, on the side. So at this point in time, it was still uh, a Docker VM uh, hosting the services. Uh, but then we introduced uh, Cloudflare into the mix as well. Um, and that becomes part of solving some of the challenges we had, uh, especially with DNS. Um, we also introduced um, uh, Azure B2C for our uh, uh, authentication needs. Um, but we'll dive a bit more into that. So in terms of uh, solving the challenges, <coughs> uh, one of the first things was, uh, was the file system. Uh, luckily for us, we had everything in Git. Uh, so it means that we, we can push a Git repository to a new location, then it will be extracted. And then you'd essentially have the same website running in a new location. Uh, it doesn't account for stuff that's been uploaded to the web route by our customers. Like if they have something that creates something on the fly, uh, then there could potentially be something missing. Um, so we needed to look at that as part of migrating our customers. Uh, media storage was handled uh, through a blob storage provider um, and was rolled out to all customers uh, in the beginning of, at the end of 2020, I think it was. Um, and that was uh, also a, a little migration project in itself, because uh, that's also fun to uh, upload, I don't know how many uh, gigabytes or terabytes of, of media uh, from a file system to, uh, to blob storage. Uh, but it worked, and we made it work. Um, then in terms of the file system itself, uh, we can't access that because it's in app service. Um, so what we did was eventually ended up making our own site extension. Uh, which is something you can create uh, as a way to extend uh, your app service web app. It runs with on, within what's called the SCM site or Kudo site. So it's behind authentication, uh, meaning that you would need uh, publishing credentials to access it. Uh, those publishing credentials are only uh, available to us, not to our customers. So we can use that as a way to provide uh, features to us behind the scenes. Uh, and we actually used it to create an API whereby we can get access to the file system because that uh, site extension is running alongside the web app. So it's, it's kind of like uh, a sidecar. Uh, I guess you would call it like an IIS version of a sidecar. Um, but it was a way for us to, to actually get access to the file system. Um, then the identity, as I mentioned, we introduced uh, Azure B2C. Uh, that was also quite a long project. I think that took us six months uh, to get introduced. Uh, the learning curve is uh, quite heavy, I would say, on Azure B2C, especially when you have to do custom policies, uh, which we had to do because uh, we also had to do a lot of migration because we had to migrate all of our users. As they log in, uh, they needed to be migrated to this new identity system. Uh, but with this, we introduced Umbrago ID, so we had our own uh, single sign-on solution uh, that we could roll out across our cloud offering and start adding that to, to the website. So. Uh, when you log in, you could, uh, or you basically just needed to log in one time and not all the time like we had before. 
Then uh, we had the DNS challenge. Um, we solved that with uh, using Cloudflare as a, as a reverse proxy. Uh, so the good thing about this is that, well, we needed all of our customers to update, update their DNS, but we needed to do it only once. Once it's done, uh, that DNS is between the customer and Cloudflare, and then between Cloudflare and us, we have full control over where we route the traffic. Um, and App Service doesn't really know anything about the host names. So there's no direct dependency uh, between the host name and, uh, and the App Service web app running, which is a huge benefit for us because that means that we can move the web app around uh, as we desire. So like if a customer upgrades from one uh, plan, cloud plan to another, for example, from starter to pro, then we can move it around over into another App Service plan. Uh, the customer won't notice it because we'll move it and then when it's up and running, we just uh, flip a switch in Cloudflare um, and then it'll point the, the custom host name to that new instance that's up and running. So essentially a migration happening behind the scenes. Um, so that allows us to, to centralize the, the management of host names. We get the benefits of Cloudflare handling all of the CLS uh, certificates for us. The renewal, we don't need to think about it. We just get it out of the box. Um, we, we can focus on what we need to do with, with the routing. Uh, and for that, we use um, what's called Cloudflare Workers um, as a way of um, coding or let's putting our custom code into a reverse proxy, so to say. So when a customer has their custom host name, they enroll it into Cloudflare. Uh, so they set up uh, either on using a C name or a, a public IP, which is provided by, uh, by Cloudflare. Then when it's enrolled, uh, we can then decide on where does that hostname go uh, within our infrastructure using a Cloudflare worker. Uh, and that's actually super handy because we can inspect the request as it's coming in uh, and we can do different things to it. Uh, this also allowed us to, to do a lot of uh, interesting things with regards to CDN uh, and providing CDN for our customers and have different caching features. Uh, but then the unique instance running in uh, in app service uh, can be anything and it can be anywhere. So uh, so a huge benefit for us. But then it came a time that uh, so we had to set up, we had we would need to know what we needed to do with regards to the DNS, with regards to migrating. Uh, so now it's time to migrate the customers. And then I'll just use this again because migrating customers, that's always interesting. <laughs> uh, especially in, in regards to ensuring that there's no downtime because none of our customers would obviously enjoy downtime. They didn't ask for this migration. Uh, it's kind of imposed by us. So we wanted to do whatever we could do to ensure that their website would not go down or be unavailable for a period of time while we migrate to a new platform. So the way that we did this was also involving Cloudflare because now we have this way of uh, actually controlling uh, where we route stuff to. Um, and we have control over the customer's custom host name. They've enrolled it into uh, to Cloudflare, um, so we can decide on where it's pointing to. Um, so starting a migration uh, is a little bit like this, so it's very high level, but uh, basically the first thing that we do is create an instance uh, of a web app in app service, so that's available. Then we, uh, we do a Git deployment from the existing uh, web app in our old infrastructure to app service, um, and then, yeah, it's pushed, it's up and running. We have a website, we have our, our own uh, custom uh, host name that we can use to, uh, to access that website uh, to verify that it's actually up and running. Uh, and a lot of this was actually uh, manual to the extent that we checked the website when it was up and running to verify that it was correct and it was showing the website as, as expected. Uh, so we, I think we did that for the first maybe four five months to ensure that we had a good process of ensuring that the website was actually up and running. So a lot of the time it was handheld by a, a migration team that was uh, a part of this project. Um, and they spent, I don't know how many hours <laughs> is for probably four or five people for five months. So quite a huge project uh, to ensure that everything's running because we wanted this to be stable for, for our customers. But then as part of uh, completing the migration, uh, when uh, the migration team had verified the website, uh, they would complete it. So this was actually something running in a durable function, uh, different steps. 
where they would just verify as part of each step that now this has been verified, then we would uh, change uh, the DNS settings in uh, in Cloudflare, uh, meaning that the custom host name would now point to app service instead of our own infrastructure. So from, from a customer perspective, they won't really notice anything because we've moved it, we ensured that it's up and running, and then we change uh, the pointing stick, so to say, uh, to where it's, where it's actually going. But yeah, so this, uh, that was the websites. Then we have all of our own services. Um, and there's, uh, there ended up being quite a lot of those. Uh, so I don't know how much you can make out of this, but uh, this is uh, mapping all of our features that we have um, in our Umbrago Cloud Portal. So the, the central part is working with a project. You can do a lot of stuff on a project. You can add custom host names. Um, you can add and remove environments. Um, you can do a lot of stuff, basically. So we, we grouped it uh, and then looked at, well, what do we need to move first of these services? Because all of these services was coded towards the old infrastructure, meaning that it was uh, calling services, which was running uh, either on a Docker VM host or as a Windows service uh, running on uh, something that had access to a file system. So we grouped it and then looked at, well, what do we need to do first? Um, and this is where we, again, use the bounded context to define where, uh, what does these services, uh, how do they fit together? Uh, what do we need? Uh, what's part of uh, hosting, for example? That's where we create the app service web apps, the app service uh, plans. Um, and adding removing environment. So we had a, a context around hosting, which consisted of five services, uh, deployment, which consisted of six services. So for when we need to, or when customers deploy between environments, uh, there's uh, six different services involved in that. And so the, the setup needed to become something like this, where our cloud portal, depending on the project and, and where it was hosted, so we could see that and determine that from the host name, um, whether it was on the old uh, infrastructure or on the new infrastructure, it needed to call either old services or new services. Um, so a lot of work went into actually making these services. And we started out with focusing on what's needed to, uh, to actually create the hosting platform, a new hosting platform, and then gradually move towards uh, having all services moved to, uh, to be uh, ready for, for working with app service. Um, so of course the initial focus was on being able to create and automate the creation of app service uh, web apps and plans. Uh, luckily for us, the, the database part was already uh, created, that was already running in this setup. Um, so we had an idea of what we needed to do with the services. But that was the first part. And then uh, when we have hosting in place, the next thing that we needed to have was deployments, because when you have your uh, Umbrago Cloud project up and running, the first thing that you need to do is deploy between environments. So we always looked at what's needed to be next and next before uh, we started so we can get the migration running, uh, but also for these uh, services to be ready and, and working for our customers when it uh, becomes time for them to work with their project. <clears throat> so uh, timeline-wise, um, this is around what we spent on uh, on the whole project. So first off, as I mentioned, the blob storage, that started before we even started with the migration project. So getting all of our customers' media moved to blob storage. Uh, that took around four months to get completed. Then uh, updating uh, hostname DNS uh, took around eight months. Just getting our customers to update their DNS settings took eight months. We had, at that, that point in time, I think we had around 9,000 custom host names, um, where we needed to reach out to all of our customers and ask them, please update your DNS settings for your host name because we are starting a migration, so we need you to move. We are moving to Cloudflare, uh, so you need to update your DNS settings for it to be able to continue to run and work with Umbrago Cloud. Um, luckily for us, a lot of our customers were uh, ready to, to do this. Uh, for some, it's not an easy change, uh, because they're a web, web agency uh, working with a customer uh, who has an IT department who then needs to update the DNS setting. So it was us getting uh, in contact with our customer who then gets uh, in contact with their customer. 
Um, so we eventually ended up having a small team that called up people and said, well, we can see you still haven't uh, updated your DNS. Please do that uh, because we need to get done. Um, so that took quite a long time and quite a lot of effort uh, getting that done. Then the development of all of the services that we had running at that point uh, modernized and moved to this uh, new setup uh, took around 10 months. Uh, so we started in the beginning of uh, 2020 uh, after we had completed uh, the migration to blob storage and we had our identity set up in place. That's when we started uh, developing these new services for the new setup. Um, and towards the end of this, uh, we also needed to uh, to provide a new uh, version of Umbrago um, in this new setup. So it took quite a long time uh, to get done. Um, yeah, and the migration itself, about eight months uh, to get everything over on the new system. And then, like any fairy tale, there's a villain at some point. Um, we encountered something uh, very soon after, I think, very soon after we started uh, migrating or having completed the first, was it maybe 100, 200 migrations of our customer projects. Um, we encountered uh, this guy. Limitations. Limitations in Azure. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> it's a uh, read the fine print, right? Whenever there's an asterisk, you read it. Um, we, we were aware of uh, app service limitations because that's part of what we investigated when we started. Uh, we looked at into well, capacity planning, right? How much can we run on an app service uh, plan in order for it to work in a good way? Uh, and what do we have available? So like file system storage, for example. So we use uh, premium, uh, the premium tier for everything. So that means that we have 250 gigabytes of uh, storage available per uh, app service plan, it would seem, but not really because then there's, you read something about storage, there's an extra, you have to read uh, the fine print because the storage limit is the total content size across all apps in the same app service plan. Yes, that's what we were anticipating, but uh, it's the total size across app service plans in a single resource group in a region cannot exceed 500 gigabytes. So even though you have 10 uh, app service plans, um, you don't get 250 gigabytes per app service plan if they're in the same resource group in the same region. And the way that we had structured it was, well, I'll first do this because, damn it, <laughs> that caught us a bit by surprise. Um, we knew that there were limits, but we hadn't seen the part about it being uh, with resource groups. Um, so that that caught us a bit by surprise because suddenly we started running out of space. And how do we run out of space? Because each website was running was using maybe uh, 200 megabytes, maybe 500, uh, maybe one gigabyte. But that's about it. So how can we run out of space when we've only migrated so and, and so many uh, web apps? Um, but yeah, so so we had to quickly reshuffle because we, uh, as part of this automation where we create app service plans. Uh, we said that uh, a standard of, well, we anticipate having something like 10 uh, app service plans within a resource group. Um, I don't remember exactly same that the correct number, but it was something like that. Um, so we had to reshuffle and then we decreased it to, well, we're gonna create a maximum of two app service plans per resource group, because then we know that, well, then we have 250 gigabytes of storage space available per app service plan. Um, and then we're sure that with regards to the limits that we set forth in, in our own apps, uh, in our own cloud plans that we want won't run out of space. Um, so that uh, that caught, uh, caught us a bit by surprise, but luckily for us, it was quick to reshuffle because it was more a configuration thing uh, that we say, how much do we create within app service plan, uh, or sorry, how many, do, how many app service plans do we create within a resource group? Um, so uh, always a good idea to look at limitations, um, especially around, is there a maximum number of resources you can create either within a resource group uh, or within a region? Um, yeah, that was a learning. Um, so if we, if we move further along, 
Um, so this um, version two of our topology infrastructure um, was probably towards when was that end of 2021. Um, we were done with uh, the migration. We were done with all of the services that were targeting the new infrastructure. We were at a point in time where we could close down our old infrastructure. But then if you remember, one of the goals I mentioned is that we also wanted to be able to expand into other regions. Uh, it was at this point in time, we only had Umbrago Cloud in uh, Western Europe. Uh, we wanted to expand to the US and potentially to other regions as well. So uh, the second iteration of our infrastructure setup was very much focused on what can we do uh, in terms of regions. Uh, so we kind of prepared for it, uh, meaning that everything that was created was created as a way of, of thinking about a region, that you create something within a region. Um, so the second iteration of the topology looked like something like this. Uh, the grand scheme of things might be a bit difficult to see, um, so we can zoom in a little bit. Uh, on a regional setup, looks very similar to uh, to what I showed before with uh, with uh, version one of our topology. But here, what we have is you know, we have Cloudflare in place, but then we also have infra service infrastructure in place. Um, and this is one of the things that was needed to be able to have the services that are used for creating app service plans, for example, within a specific region, to be able to handle deployments within a region run within that region. So we have a setup where uh, all of the services that are needed are running within that region. And then we have a global setup where the things that are inherently global, like identity uh, and our own cloud portal, uh, has its own uh, service uh, infrastructure as well. So we can have something running that's global, uh, like our portal, where we maintain all of the data and all of the relationship between uh, the infrastructure. Um, that we are running and creating. So in order to achieve this, um, we've used uh, Terraform. Um, I don't know how much you can you can see of this, um, but we created this whole setup uh, in Terraform uh, around creating uh, a global setup infrastructure and a regional uh, re infrastructure. Um, so it's in very high level. Uh, it looks something like this where we have a global setup um, where all of the stuff that's regional uh, needs to be able to um, uh, publish messages um, through a service bus that can be read uh, from a global perspective. Uh, so global needs to be able to uh, receive messages from within a region, uh, knowing what happens within that region so it can react accordingly. For example, when you add a new environment to a project and when that's done, we need to notify our cloud portal about that, or the cloud portal needs to be notified uh, so that it can send a message to the user about it being done and then update uh, the, uh, the data for that uh, project uh, so that it shows the correct number of environments that's in there. Um, and then from a regional perspective, if we wanted to create a setup where uh, all of our teams can be independent of each other. Uh, they can roll their own services and roll their own infrastructure for each of their services uh, without it being a coordination task of uh, coordinating something with a, a platform or operations team that they can they have the dependence uh, or interdependence to um, to uh, to create everything themselves. So the regional setup is uh, is also created in a way where we create uh, from a platform perspective we create uh, an AKS cluster uh, as part of it we create. Um, an app configuration, we create a key vault, we create a, a, a service bus, uh, which is provided as resources that services have available as part of running within a region. Uh, so that means they use that service bus to, uh, to publish messages so other services can subscribe to those messages. And from a global perspective, um, there's a service relay, which relays all of these messages so that can be read uh, from a global perspective. Um, but it also means that uh, this setup needed to work in a way where uh, we could write Terraform within each service uh, repository. Uh, and we actually managed to, uh, to achieve that. Um, and it works in, in a really nice way. Uh, but also good that each of uh, our teams can create, if they need a database, they just write Terraform to create a database. Um, and then the, the pipeline is, uh, is incorporated in a way so that it gets uh, information from a 
uh, about the regional uh, platform um, so that it can create its own infrastructure within that platform and it has access to certain resources like Key Vault, for example, uh, because it needs access to Key Vault to get the connection string for a service bus. And all services use that service bus to publish their messages. Um, um, so, so that's what we did in, in this whole setup. Um, this just shows the outline of our infrastructure, uh, how we divided it into different environments, um, and how we divide it up into regions. So within each environment, we can have uh, any number of regions that we want to. Um, it's mostly at this point in time about going in, creating a folder, uh, creating a, a Terraform script, just a main script, give it some parameters saying, what region is this? Uh, where should it be hosted? So I would create, for example, one in, in UK South, give it that region of Azure, uh, set it up, uh, create a pull request, then from the platform team, they can approve it. Uh, and then more or less, we have a new region up and running. This also becomes kind of a, a service catalog because each of the services would go in here and register uh, their service. So they get a service principle that enables them to create infrastructure uh, they need within that region. And that service principle is limited to only being able to deploy within that region. And then we have a, a global um, AD admin service principle type thing uh, that keeps these regional service principles up to date so they don't expire. They're renewed every 30 days. So we're not in a situation where suddenly someone can't deploy uh, to production or release a new service because a service principle expired and uh, the person who has access to that, uh, to renew that is on vacation. Uh, so we don't want to be in that situation. Um, so that's why we have a setup where this is automatically renewed. <clears throat> oh, that was the wrong way. So here, yes. So we had this glo uh, global setup. Um, so basically, uh, we uh, ended up, I think, after one and a half years achieving the goals that we set out to. Um, it was quite a long journey um, and some bumps along the way, but we ended up with a new and modern platform. We have a setup now which enables us to expand Umbrago Cloud into uh, new regions. Um, and it allows us to, uh, to have teams that can work independent of each other, uh, create the resources that they need, deploy it into regional setup. We can expand to new regions. When we open up a new region, all of the services that we have will automatically be deployed into that region. You don't really need to think of it. You don't need to co coordinate uh, with all of the teams and get them to say, well, now we're opening up, for example, a UK region. Uh, now we need all teams to deploy their services into that region. They don't need to think about it. So a really nice way of, of, of working with infrastructure and services and having a service infrastructure platform. Um, this gave us a lot of flexibility, both in terms of services. Uh, we ended up getting a lot of flexibility in terms of what we can do. Uh, so we can now also provide dedicated resources to our customers uh, because we are kind of piggybacking on top of uh, Azure App Service. Uh, we're utilizing what they have to uh, expose that to our customers. And because we work with web agencies, uh, we can do a lot of stuff to remove a lot of the friction uh, that they would have if they needed to create everything in Azure. So they can click a few buttons and then they get a project up and running with uh, three environments, three databases, CDN, uh, host names, all of that. They don't need to do anything. It's just a click of a button. Uh, they don't need to write Terraform or ARM templates or whatever. Uh, they can just go in and create it and then start working on it immediately. Um, and then they, they get a lot of the flexibility uh, for them as well, as well because uh, we can expose uh, what app service provides uh, to them as well. And then we can tailor it so that it fits with uh, an Umbrago cloud mindset. Um, so yeah, really, really a lot of benefits that we got out of this. Um, and we are very, very happy with app service. Uh, stability has been A plus. Uh, since we moved, we haven't had any outages. Uh, which is fantastic. Uh, we've been there for, what, I guess the better part of a year now, more than a year. Um, and from where we came from, uh, where we kind of struggled with that from time to time, because it was a bit of our, out of our hands uh, with this black box setup, uh, it's just nice seeing that it, it runs smoothly. Um, we don't need to focus on as much on operations. Of course, we haven't completely forgotten about it. We still do a lot of operations and in terms of ensuring that everything is up and running, 
and running smoothly. Um, but we have to do a lot less now than what we had to do before. And also isolation is much better than what we could achieve before uh, because we decide on uh, which of our customers are uh, pooled together, so to say. Uh, we can decide on how many resources are shared. Uh, we can decide on uh, yeah where and how we do it. Um, that just gives us a lot of flexibility um, that we didn't have before and that we couldn't achieve um, in our own setup. So uh, in summary, uh, we crossed that bridge that I showed you in the beginning. Uh, we overcame the winter of 2021-22. Uh, um, I don't remember if it was a particularly bad winter, but uh, it sounded cool on the slides. Um, we slayed the dragons of Azure limitations. We, we <laughs> overcame it, uh, luckily fairly fast. Uh, and uh, the dev teams got the platform they always wanted and management lived happily ever after. So it was a, a fairy tale story at the end of the day. And as you can see, our management is uh, super happy being in the clouds. Um, so yeah, again, this, this is my CEO. So I'm not sure if he's watching this, but uh, he's seen this before. <laughs> but with that, uh, I would just say thank you for listening. Uh, I hope you got something out of it, maybe some, some inspiration. Um, I'm happy to elaborate more on, on the whole setup around our Terraform, uh, if you are interested in that. Uh, it's, it's a bit complex to relay across a, a, a presentation, uh, but if you're interested, I'm happy to show you more. So uh, thank you for listening. Yeah, uh, if there's uh, any questions at all? Or... Great. <laughs> Yes.